Ah, uh, procrastination, my old friend. If the next five to seven minutes seem a bit disjointed, it has a bit to do with me writing this script at 3 a.m. the day of filming. Hashtag no regrets. So now that we've brought my old high school habits back into play on this YouTube channel, let's see if I can make a helpful review out of an ink that, well, I just still can't put my finger on where it will fit in my collection. Okay, I know where it will fit in my collection, but if I gave it away right here off the bat, then what kind of reviewer would I be? A concise one with more viewers, but that is besides the point. You are here for the ink, so let's see if I can make this transition flow into the review. Get it? Ink? Flow? Don't worry, I will show myself out here in a few minutes. First up is this beefy box. I'm normally not one to gush about boxes, but with how long it's been since I've gotten more than 30 mils of ink, I forgot how big of a box you actually need for a 50 mil chonkster. More importantly though, if you are like me and tend to order a bunch of inks at one time to go ahead and do reviews, then it helps to have the ink name somewhere on the box. In this case, all we have on top is Lamy and a number. All we have on front, Lamy and a number. Side one, nothing. Side two, nothing. Side three, nothing. Bottom side, barcode and company information. That's not really helpful at four o'clock in the morning when you're trying to get your currently inked filled out and you forgot what ink it was, so you've got to go to Pen Chalet, pick out your order history, and actually look through the list of inks to see which Lamy ink you actually ordered. <sighs> I mean, it, it's, it, you can t see it's just a headache. I mean, it even got me to go off script there. That's, that's how big of a headache it is for me. But moving past the outer box and ignoring information about nib divots and blotter strips, what we have when we open it is this big, teal capped chunky bottle and from the top down you could be forgiven thinking that you are getting a substantial amount of ink i say that for a reason you flip this over and what you have now is a plastic housing that holds your blotter paper which okay lami i appreciate that you gave us some blotter paper here but let's have an honest moment here this Blotter paper sucks. It just sucks, dude. Like, you'd be better off just giving us a good-looking bottle and ignoring the blotter paper. There's one ply at truck stop bathrooms that do a better job cleaning a nib than this stuff. I mean, okay, yeah, I feel another rant coming on, so let's just get to the good stuff. On the positives, at the bottom here, we have a nib divot. That's what they were talking about on this flap of the box. It really does make it easier to fill your pens. More pen ink manufacturers need to make this. Like a little nib divot goes a long way. It gives you that little extra bit to actually get the feed into the ink. So when you're filling it, like, you know, twisting the converter, whatever the case may be, it's a lot easier to fill. Not enough brands do that. Normally you've got a flat bottom on the ink bottle and it becomes a complete pain in the butt to fill. Lamy at least went out of the way to make sure that's not gonna be an issue for you. So kudos to that. But this bottle is going to lead to more rants than anything else. So let's go ahead and move past the bottle and move on to the KPIs. This week, we are starting off with water and I'm gonna break with good reviewer etiquette here and just let you know that this is not a good showing. To be fair, we have seen worse here on the channel, but not by much. With the water on the page, you can see that we're already getting a good amount of color left and, as we zoom in, there isn't really a bold base layer on display. And once we get water off the page, all that is left is a faint ghosting layer. This level of ghosting, along with the shade of color in play, does make for a situation where lighting could make this extremely difficult to recover. But what about dry time? Well, maybe that'll help turn the sink around. Before that, though, a word from our furry sponsors. Technically, they don't sponsor the channel, but they do behave long enough for me to film and edit these videos for you wonderful people. If you like these reviews and want to help keep them coming, consider becoming a patron. 
for $2 a month, you can help with some of the overhead like ink procurement, equipment upgrades, and most importantly, giving back to these amazing furballs. So if you have two bucks lying around each month and want to pitch in, then click on that Patreon link down below. So looking at these dry times, I've got to admit that this is actually a good showing. On Rhodia, this is functionally dry at the 10 second mark with a broad nib. And then as we move on over to Tomoe and actually get the dry times in focus there, you can see that we are actually functionally dry by the 15 second mark. And compared to the slow drying inks that we've had here recently on the channel, this is a very welcome change. And with the color on display here, I'm happy to see those dry times because if we look at this ink blot, on display is a good showing of the lighter mids on the bottom right, which are a true teal, fading into an even truer teal here on the mids on the left. Now, I do also like the velvety look that we do get in the center here before this ink fades into a deep pinkish sheen. And to its credit, the sheen is very well done here. It's not overly sheening, it's not like Walden Pond level, but it's enough to give this ink character. And kudos to Lamy for the color and dry time. I mean, this combination here does help make up for that water performance that we saw earlier. So if you can tell by now, I actually do like this ink. And yes, it is staying in the collection. 50 mils of ink should last me for a long time, and this is an amazing color profile. It's also a bit of a chameleon. I found that teal is one of those colors that really relies on ambient lighting to complete its color profile. If you look up this ink online, while swatch pictures will be somewhat close to each other, they will all have noticeable differences. And I don't think this is a batch variance issue as much as it is a camera color profile issue and with how subjective of a color teal tends to be. So if this is one of those colors that you would want to add to your ink collection, I would recommend taking a look at every swatch or video of this ink available to you as lighting can make or break this particular color. For me, at 5500 Kelvin illumination and a measured 1600 lumens at my desk when I'm not doing reviews, this is a good daily driver. And that holds true under these review lights that are a magnitude brighter than my already overly bright office. I should probably also mention the important factors. On Tomoe, this is a bold ink with a nice dynamic range from the mids into those transition tones, and I think in a double broad, you could easily have this ink fade over into that subtle sheen. It actually does that on my Aurora Oroloid, but that pen is already just weird. On Rhodia, there was a slight decrease in line width, but it is still on the broader side of medium. The dynamics are also on par with what is presented over on Tomoe. The last thing I will mention though, is the flow and overall feel. Both are on point here. There have been no hard starts, no skipping, and no bad behavior whatsoever from this ink. Long and short of it, if you can avoid being like me and not getting this ink wet, then this could be a daily driver for you. I'm a clumsy person, so this is going to be more of a hobby and journal ink, which for an ink is still a win in my book and totally worth the $10 that I paid for this one. And that does it for our look at Lamy Tourmaline. If you liked that video or found it helpful, then hit that like button, get subscribed, and I'll see you in the next one. Look, Ma, I'm hacking the planet. Yay!